dominating your field of business is all about the three P's as we always say. Preparation, preparation and preparation. Now doing that preparation requires the latest insight and intel. And here in Biznomics, in your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes, that is exactly what we deliver to you. Welcome to Biznomics. I'm Tarin Amara Sekara. And today, we will be focusing on a very special industry. An industry filled with innovation and one where we have had few key players coming forward and creating some strong success stories. Have you ever walked into a nice comfortable space and enjoyed the ambience? Well, behind all that comfort and that enjoyment was probably a billion or so dollars worth industry. When I'm talking about the paints and coatings industry. Where is this industry in Sri Lanka? And what are the innovations we are looking at? How can we further improve and go beyond in this sector? To talk about this and more, we have a very special guest joining us today, who is none other than Nishal Ferdinando, the CEO of Jack Holdings Limited. Nishal, welcome to Bisnomics. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me, Tarindu. Nishal, let's paint a nice picture and the true picture about this industry today. Yes. Now, if you look at this paints industry, paints and coatings industry, what is its contribution to the Sri Lankan economy? And how big is this industry globally? Let's talk some numbers. Right. So, in the Sri Lankan context, uh, I would say the industry is around 40 billion rupees. Uh, and uh, that is primarily uh, from the decorative paints, which has around 24 billion. Your wood coatings has around 7 to 8 billion and automobile paints has another 7 billion and the rest comes from powder coating and other sorts of different form for the tins and all of that separate specialized coatings. So this is the 40 billion that uh, we contribute to the construction industry. If you take globally, I would say the industry is around 155 billion, right? And out of that 155 billion, uh, again, the decorative industry, the decorative paints industry contributes about 47 percent. Uh, the wood coating would be about 7 to 8 percent and the automobile about 12 percent globally. From this, Asia Pacific, I would say, contributes around 45 percent of the entire world demand. So, so we are at like an epicenter for this industry. Yes, yes. So uh, and even if you take in South Asia, if you take South Asia with India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, right, from Asia Pacific, I would say we contribute a fair amount to this economy and to the picture of this total paint industry. And correct me if I'm wrong, Nishal, but I believe that this industry globally, despite the pandemic, is facing a good growth rate of about 4.3 percent. Yes. So. It's uh, a very uh, interesting sort of uh, thing because it's different why it's growing in South Asia. It's different why it's growing uh, maybe in Europe and in America. So if you take during the pandemic, uh, if, you, if you look at Europe and uh, USA, right, uh, and even Australia to that extent. So there is more of a do-it-yourself culture. And when people were under lockdown and they were at home, so they had they had a lot of spare time, right? And they had maybe two to three months of maybe decorating your house, right? Maybe doing some home improvements. Michelle, are you saying that people finally had the time to look at their walls and ceilings? Exactly. Because I think they realized that it needed a fresh coat, right? So due to that, a lot of people in these countries started painting their houses, starting, started to renovate their houses, basically due to the spare time, right? But if you take South Asia, yet the DIY culture is not that predominant, right? So we are yet used to someone coming to your house, a painter coming to your house and doing it for you. The famous for you. paint bars. The paint bars, right? So we are yet in, in that culture. But if you look at the pandemic, even that South Asia also grew. How did that grow is because if you take Sri Lanka, right? Sri Lanka, the interest rates came down. Interest rates came down and people... I think in the last 10 to 15 years, it was the lowest interest rates in the country at the moment. So a lot of people started renovating their houses. They started taking loans. They started building, if they had a slab, they started building on top of it, right? And they started doing home improvements because they had the financial ability to get a loan, right? So that actually propelled the paint industry to improve in Sri Lanka as well and for it to grow. So I would say two different 
two different uh, reasons why it grew. Understood. But that that it kept on growing during the pandemic and one of the few industries in the construction sector that thrived during the pandemic. So what would you say, yes, from a market viewpoint, yes, the pandemic seems to have been good. But when you consider other angles, supply chain uh, issues and then labor related matters, yes. production related challenges. Yes. What was the overall impact of COVID-19 on this industry? Yeah, so the biggest challenge was raw materials. The biggest challenge was raw materials. And, we, and I think you know that the freight industry, the rates really doubled, tripled over time. Absolutely. And with that, getting the required raw materials to manufacture paint, even some of the top global uh, paint giants didn't have the required raw material. And uh, the scarcity of the raw material was the major factor that affected this industry. So the players who had abundant access to raw material, the players who were strong financially survived and they increased their market share. Whereas certain other players globally who were not as big or not as financially strong or didn't have access to raw materials sort of suffered. So I would say during this pandemic, the larger players, they increased their volume, they increased the market grew, but their market share also grew comparatively to the smaller companies. If you take in Sri Lanka also, predominantly we import all of the raw materials to manufacture paint. So even in Sri Lanka, I would say it was the same sort of uh, mechanism where the larger players sort of dominated and the players who had more financial ability, they survived this, right? But the smaller players, suffered. So that I would say yet now it's about 13 to maybe 15 months since Sri Lanka was under the first lockdown. So I would say Sri Lanka has around 60 paint companies in total. Like that lot 60. of people, lot of people that's will not know that. I find hard to believe. Yes. So that's because your, your large players, I would say around five, but you have a very small industry as well, like small mid, mid size industry in paint. And that constitutes another 45 to 50. So the Paint Manufacturers Association has around 60. Now, out of that, I would say maybe about 20% suffered due to the lack of raw materials. That is one aspect of it. The second aspect is, like I told you in Sri Lanka, it's yet the paint bass culture. So with people having the medical risk and all of that, they were a little bit reluctant to let them, to come. Let them come in. So I would say if you take the paint industry, the painters also suffered because there was not much work during that time, but there was a demand for work. People used to buy the paint, they used to keep it, but then they think twice before you get the paint bars. So uh, I think a lot of companies in Sri Lanka, including ours, supported the paint bases during this time, right? And came up with various schemes to support them financially. And I think together, overall, the industry survived. And if you look at the construction projects now, in Sri Lanka, I would say the paint industry, I would divide into two or three angles. One is the domestic demand. The other one is the construction demand for major projects. And the other one is the industries, right? So there, the construction projects started, it, was, it never stopped fully. So with that, the major or the huge large-scale construction projects gave employment, right? But it was the domestic painters that suffered somewhat. But now I think with the vaccination drive and everything, I would say that it has uh, all, it's almost at the normal level of uh, operations. And if you look at uh, the impact of this pandemic, especially on these, uh, the paint buses as we call it, they are a very important stakeholder for this sector, I believe. Yes. And yes. was there any way in which they were supported by the government as well? Well, so the paint buses in Sri Lanka are either contractors or daily wage. Uh, that's that's their sort of thing. So either you get paid on a daily basis or you get a contract on a square foot basis, right? So they are very rarely you have painters employed by construction companies or even paint companies. So they were hit severely under the lockdown and all of that. So under the general scheme of uh, maybe the daily wage people getting that uh, getting a certain amount from the government, yes, I think they were helped. But I don't, I am not aware of any specific sort of uh, bailouts or any sort of assistance that the government gave specifically for painters. So Understood. that is where the paint companies actually stepped up, 
right? And there were programs such as, uh, say, if people have, they have done work halfway and it has stopped, right? There were certain paint companies who gave, uh, who gave the certain amount of goods that were missing for them to complete the job FOC, right? There were loyalty schemes introduced in order to sustain the pain buses, right? So a lot of the pain companies stepped up to facilitate and to assist this, this community during the pandemic. Good on the industry players, Nishal, good to yes. hear that. Now, let's talk about innovation. Now, we see so many different uh, organizations that are into different types of innovations. Even in your organization, I've seen the very interesting innovation of petal paints and so on. Yes. How important is innovation in this sector? And most importantly, globally, Sri Lankan paints, what place do we have? So that's a very good question. So innovation, I would say it's very important for the paint industry. Now, for example, when the pandemic hit, there were paints that came out that sort of helped uh, prevent uh, the infection spreading, wow. right? So that, I would say, some of the global paint companies developed this within a span of about three to four months. Okay, If you take Africa, they are, a, they are a paint where it's a sort of a mosquito repellent, where you have severe cases of dengue, right? And in malaria. Uh, and malaria, yes, in Africa. So there are companies that have introduced this, right, where it's a sort of a mosquito repellent pain. Where there is excessive heat, right, you have heat reflective, right, and with, I mean, uh, different climate conditions and there are so many changes in the world in terms of the climate. There are so many changes in the world in terms of maybe even the pandemic, right, even certain diseases, there are antibacterial pain that are being developed, right. So, we just see, I mean, or a layman will just see colors and they will say, okay, the best innovation is the number of colors that you get. No. That's not the case. But there is so much of performance coatings in this paint industry and I'm, I'm only touching at the moment, this is the uh, decorative paints, that is the paints that you do for the walls. Even in the wood coating, right, even the introduction of a water-based wood coating because usually you don't take water and wood together, right? If you yeah. just say, okay, you put water on wood, right? There is about, the, I mean, that is sort of not recommended anywhere. But then the industry came up with water-based wood coatings, which was a revolution because the other paint is a solvent base. And when painters do solvent base, it is bad for their health, right? It's bad for their health because the fumes and Correct. You, you know the smell that you get once for you sure. paint. So water That's based, why they say normally when, after you do painting, don't go to a room for a few days exactly, and they say that. Exactly. So in the wood industry, water base sort of eliminated that total thing and where it's very healthy now for any painter. So innovation, I would say, is extremely important. And innovation also should suit the changing, uh, changing variables in a country or in a climate, right? All of that. So uh, in terms of that, I would say in Sri Lanka, as well, uh, the paint companies are innovative, right? And they are, they have taken various steps. Even our company itself, after the IPO, we are going for a state of the art R and D facility. Right? That's because we understand how important innovation is. Plus, you said uh, the Sri Lankan paint as against the world paint, right? What? Do, how do we sort where of? Do we where do we stand? So, in terms of exports, I am uh, sad to say that. We uh, we import around maybe 30 million worth of raw materials, but our total exports uh, in terms of rupees is only maybe 10 percent of that, right? So there is a there is a there is a huge amount of improvement and market penetration that the Sri Lankan paint companies can have in terms of exports. Right. Absolutely. So we are going to come back to you on more detail on that, uh, Nisha. Yes. What are the supply chain challenges of the paints and coating industry? Let's talk about that on the other side of this short break. This is Biznomics. Welcome back to Biznomics. We are in conversation with Nishal Ferdinando regarding the paints and coating industry of Sri Lanka. Nishal, now any industry which is into manufacturing, especially the sector that you are in, when you think about the supply chain, I believe that the supply chain would definitely have gone through some 
transformation, especially due to COVID-19. What are the supply chain challenges that this industry is facing? And especially with regard to raw material and with so many import restrictions being there and also certain dollar obtaining restrictions being in place, what challenges is this industry facing? Yeah, so in terms of a Sri Lankan context, like I told you, all the raw materials or majority of the raw materials are imported. And uh, the sourcing of this has been the challenge. The sourcing of this has been the challenge. But uh, now at this juncture of the pandemic, I would say it has eased out. Initially, there was severe shortages of uh, the raw materials. I think that was common to almost all industries. All industries. Because they say a lot of the gigantic ports of the world and seven of them being in China, they yes. all had to shut down due to COVID scare, creating a huge block of all these containers. Correct, correct. That and also there is, okay, if you take decoratives, one major raw material is titanium. Titanium in Sri Lanka, majority import from China. So initially during when, the, when China was hit by the pandemic, there was severe shortages of that. So we also as a country or a paint industry in Sri Lanka had to look for alternative suppliers, right, where... We were comfortable for the last 5-10 years working with certain amount of raw material suppliers. We had to think out of the box and we had to also do certain amount of R&D for substitutes. Right? So, I would say the, the industry adapted right, quite well, right, quite well, where they, uh, we came up with certain alternative raw materials. We looked at different countries to source the raw materials from uh, that is different from who we were getting it from previously and uh, the shipping time, right? So, what I like I told you, the companies that were financially strong, right, they uh, even went for stock for even maybe six months. Usually, we keep stocks of about three months, right? So, we had to double it, right? So, the because strong, of the uncertainty as well. Because of the uncertainty, because of the uncertainty and the demand was there. So, if the demand dropped, I think we would have balanced this off. Right? But the demand was increasing from one side and you have the raw material scarcity from the other side and the that's shipping time. a perfect time. storm. Yes. So, that's, I think that, would, that was the major challenge that uh, I would say the industry faced. But I would say that there was nowhere where uh, people were short of paint. Now, if you go to a hardware, right, where if you wanted certain paint, right, I don't think any hardware said that they're out of paint. So, I would say the industry in Sri Lanka faced this well, the, right? re the resilience was good. The resilience was good. The resilience was good. Uh, the second thing is, uh, we'll say the foreign currency, right? The foreign for the, for the ch challenges in uh, remitting foreign currency, to, opening to your TTs, yes. LCs. So there are two. Uh, I think the first thing was the LCs were ninety days or sixty days. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it was a ninety day LC that the government sort of specified. So with this, the suppliers in Sri Lanka. Uh, and the companies who are in Sri Lanka and their suppliers, it showed the strength of the supply chain because most of them agreed to give three months or six months credit, right? So, the, the LC, the issue of the use and sales is or three months or six months sales is were somewhat negated because the suppliers sort of coordinate or cooperated with the local industry. So, that too, I would say the local industry faced it quite well, Taridu. Uh, and now, now, I think where the shortage of dollars have even sort of exceeded, right, again, the strong companies who have stocks are surviving, right, but the, I would say the uh, medium and small term or small scale players are suffering in that sort of sector. Understood. Let's talk about the role of technology, because nowadays it's very difficult to think of any industry, Nishal, that is not having an impact from technology. Yes. It's beyond just the production technologies. We speak about robotics. We, spoke, we speak about digital selling or digital marketing. What are the technological implications that we see in the paints and coating industry? And once again, Nishal, you are a very well experienced person in this sector. Share with us the scenario or paint with us the scenario of the Sri Lankan context and the global scenario. Right. So, in terms of manufacturing, yes, robotics has come in, automation to a great extent. Even has in Sri come Lanka. In. Even uh, in Sri Lanka, not robotics, okay. but automation, right? Automation. Uh, and so, if you look at the world and Sri Lanka in terms of manufacturing technology, 
I would say that there is a far amount where we have to sort of reach to uh, come to that level. One thing is, if you look at the world companies that manufacture in USA or even in Japan, right, or China, the scale, the volume, right, is massive, right. But in Sri Lanka, you don't need that uh, scale because you have a 20 million population, unless you are looking at exports, right. So the economies of scale does not warrant for massive robotics and automation to that extent in the production area. The numbers right? don't add up. The numbers don't add up unless you are looking at the bigger picture of exporting. Right? So uh, the world has developed a lot in that scale. But if you look at the coating technologies, now, for example, in wood coating, from water base to PU, you now have the UV coatings. Right? UV coatings is where you can actually take a chair, you put it into the UV coating ovens, right, and the spray. Within five minutes, you have a fully coated uh, chair with uh, a wooden chair, I'm referring to wooden chair, right, with a superior coating that can give you a warranty of even maybe 15 years against scratch resilience, against heat, against all of that. So now Sri Lanka does not, unfortunately, uh, the industry, if you take the industry, not only the paint industry, the coatings industry as well, right? So they go hand in hand. I they mean. go hand in hand. So no one has yet invested in a UV coating machine. But if you take Bangladesh, who was, I would say, 10 or 15 years before, were at a lower level than the Sri Lankan coating industry, they have at least five to six like major factories doing this UV technology. Is it the power of the economies of scale, Nishar? I would say, yes, the domestic demand of maybe 190 million population and the, I mean, the that they went for quality, right? In Sri Lanka, if you, if I, if I focus a little bit on the wood coating yes. uh, industry, in Sri Lanka, yet you get a fair amount of carpenters using the primary form of coating, right? which was also the same case in Bangladesh. But the general public and the industry pushed high level of coatings, right? And they demanded, then the general public also demanded a higher level of coating there. What happened there is in Bangladesh, because of the domestic industry improving, they have the ability now to export, right? So they are exporting to Europe in the wood coating industry, they are Europe, Australia, right? Even Bangladesh is exporting to India. But Sri Lanka, if you look at it, because that, that gap of embracing technology to develop the product or to increase the product has been slow, our export market is very poor. Right? So I would, say, I would say the technology in terms of manufacturing, I think we can manage, but we need to come up with the coating. Right? Even if you just take a, a construction site, right? you yet get your bus that comes manually, he will take... Uh, sort of thing and do the the party, then he will take your paint brush, he will paint it, right? It's the traditional way. But you have the spray gun. I mean, the simple thing is abroad, there are, I mean, the technology of just spraying the wall, right, with paint. It's much faster. But why can't you do that in Sri Lanka? Because before the paint comes the brick wall. So the ondulance on the brick wall, if they don't do that properly, it's difficult to spray. Correct. Or the plaster, right? So... We, we have to, in terms of Sri Lanka, we need to improve the construction industry itself yes. for us to embrace technology in terms of the paint, in terms of the coating systems as well. I would say it's more the coating systems because you can increase productivity, you can increase efficiency and you are having a window to go outside of the country. Right? So I, I would say that's where, that's where we are lacking, Taridu. Some very good thoughts there, Nishar. Now... Can we be satisfied with the support that the government is giving for this sector? Because, as you very correctly said, look at Bangladesh. Yeah. 10, 15 years later than us, they entered the industry. And still, today, as you said, they are, they are exporting their products to the rest of the world. Yes. Whereas, we seem to be just uh, getting, to a certain extent, irrelevant in a global stage. Correct. This, I believe, needs proper government support and government policy. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I would, I would just rephrase it, governments, right? So from, from the start itself, I don't think any government has focused on the bigger picture in this paint industry. 
right. So, first thing is you need to you have multinational companies in Sri Lanka, you have the local companies in Sri Lanka. I would say first you need to have an even playing field because sometimes you have multinational companies in order to get a fair amount of market share, right, getting their products into the hardwares at phenomenal discounts of even 60 percent and giving a huge amount of credit, right. There are certain uh, certain companies who would give even six months credit, right. So, this what happens is it, it does not give an even playing field for the local players. Okay. So, I would say that there has to be some sort of control from the government, right, to ensure that the local companies, I am not saying that local companies should have preference or nothing like that. Right, I would say the first step is the local companies to have an even playing field and a fair chance, a fair chance and to take certain steps to prevent multinationals from bulldozing their way in getting market share. That is the first thing. Second thing is as an industry as a whole, if you look at the, if you look at a painter, right, how many people uh, would take pride in saying that look, I am a painter or a child saying that my father is a painter, right. So, that concept in Sri Lanka, abroad if you take, a painter is a very respectable job, sure. right. They give that, they, they have created that sort of professionalism in a painter. In Sri Lanka, a painter would not be, it would be considered like a handyman. Paint bass. Right? Bass, right. I think that mentality, if the government can change, if the government can educate painters to be professional painters, to be a professional job, right? When you when you give a job to a painter, you know that that is done and that's it. You don't need to check on it again. So, you need to have your trainings, you need to have the, maybe the schools, right? You need to, you need to add value to the painter. Not only the painter, I would say even the bosses and everyone in the construction industry. If that profession is given value, Tarindu, then what happens is the industry can develop. Right, we can add, we can bring even certain tools, certain things because right now it's only very, it's extremely price sensitive, right? A person, for example, abroad, now we, uh, we represent certain uh, brush manufacturers, right? And when you go for training abroad, there are certain tools that they use to paint extremely fast, right? And extremely efficiently. Correct. Now, here we can't bring that because the mentality is, you no, know, the cheapest brush or the cheapest way of doing there it. There is no professionalism in the industry. There is no professionalism the government has to create that. I would say the biggest thing that the government can do is to add value to the industry is to add value to the painter. If you add value to the painter, then the paint industry, yes, will come up there. The next thing is what I would say is support, as in support not to support the paint manufacturers. You support the industries that use paint. Correct. If, if it is the furniture industry, create Sri Lanka has, a, I mean, a history of very good furniture, right? If you sort of enable them to export, you give that industry certain benefits, Correct. right? Then what the happens? associated and the related industries. Exactly. Help them to prosper right. and then the pain industry will prosper. And we can't, we can't only depend on a Sri Lankan economy. We have to go up, right? So, if they do that, I would say that that can enable the paint industry to increase. Also, the construction firms. If you, if you give the construction firms the ability to improve, they can go outside and do construction. How many foreign contractors come to Sri Lanka and do construction? Why can't our Sri Lankan construction companies go abroad and do the same thing? And when they go, go like that, they'll also take our paints they industry take, as well. Exactly. So, what I'm saying is focus on those. If a government, any government focus on those, automatically your paint industry will also, it'll, it'll improve and it'll come to a different level. Nishal, it's very encouraging to see the enthusiasm and passion you have for this industry. We are going to come back to you on more detail on that. Yes. Stay tuned. We will be back after this short break. This is Bisnomi. Welcome back to Bisnomics, your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. Our focus is on the paints and coating industry and we are in conversation with Nishal Ferdinando. Nishal. Let's talk about the value-adding aspect of this. Now, you did mention the problem of a huge amount of imports being involved with this industry. If you look at the import and export uh, balance, how does it tilt towards what? 
and most importantly, how much of a value adding are we really doing from this sector? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of imports, I would say that the value addition on the imported material would be about 30 to 40 percent, right? Again, in terms of labor, in terms of certain other raw material that we add here, I would say it would vary maybe 30 to 40 percent, okay? But the sad part is starting to, you, I think I earlier also mentioned this, the export industry from Sri Lanka in terms of paint is extremely poor, right? Where 30 billion worth of raw material we are importing, we export a finished goods maximum of 10 percent of that, right? I won't say it's even above 3 billion. So this is, this is where the industry has to think bigger, right? The industry has to see because we have, if you really look at it, there can be instances where in Sri Lanka you might be able to source some of these raw materials. But it's the or infrastructure. Maybe substitutes. substitutes, right? So it's the infrastructure that is lacking, right? It's the infrastructure and it's the system that is lacking to sort of get these raw materials from the country. Also, there are companies who manufacture this raw material who we can induce them to come and set up in Sri Lanka. So the extraction of certain minerals and all of that can be done from Sri Lanka with that technology and given to the local industry. So you have, we, I mean, even as a, maybe as policy holders, people have to think a little bit in that scale, right? Maybe even the companies have to look at backward vertical integration and see whether there are any raw materials that we can source from Sri Lanka, right? And with the present government sort of uh, vision of maybe reducing imports and and sort of uh, empowering local industry. So I think the paint industry also has to fall in line with this, has to fall in line. And once you do that, there are so many markets that you can export to, right? The company I represent, we export to most of the South Asian countries. We are now looking at Africa to export. So there are opportunities, there are opportunities right? You can even set up plants there. Okay, so and then obviously the revenue comes back to the country. Absolutely. So you have to think big. You can't restrict yourself for 20 million population is what I'm saying. That's not right? sustainable as you said. No, and paint is not rocket science, right? I mean, yes, you if you have proper R&D facilities and all, I would say you can, we can compete with some of the world's best uh, paint companies. But we need to think big. We need to invest in maybe foreign scientists or chemists coming in to the country bringing technology we need to we need to invest on the equipment that does this testing right and then the industry will grow if we only try to take the technology from someone else and try to copy that here that would not work right so i think i think that's where that's where this that's the main reason why the import and the export there's so much of a gap in Sri Lanka, in a Sri Lankan context, is because we are not innovative enough and we are not thinking big. Nisha, let's talk about a very important facet of this industry, safety concerns. Now, I believe, especially with uh, given the nature of the industry, with so much of chemicals and various other components involved, and this being an industry where the fine finished output can have a direct impact on the health of the consumer as well. What are the main safety-related concerns of this industry? and? How does one really manage it well? Yeah, so the first safety precaution comes in storage of chemicals, right? When we manufacture, there are so many chemicals that we bring into the factories or to the warehouse, right? There are certain protocols that you have to follow, right? And uh, the second thing is in the manufacturing. I told you there are solvent-based coatings which we use here. Yes. So solvent-based, you need to wear your mask, you need to wear your safety gears when you manufacture this. Right, there are basic separate precautions. Basic precautions, basic precautions, but you need to follow this. Yes. Right? You need the discipline. You need the, you need the discipline and the companies also need to understand that that is important. It's an important element. And even even the even for certain certain uh, manufacturing processes, there are separate separate areas which you need to do that. Right. So that is in terms of uh, in terms of the manufacturing and in terms of the storage part of it. The finished product, like I told you, if we move towards greener, right, water-based products, right, that, I mean, it's water-based, right, what, what can, there's no chemicals in there, 
right other than the unlike the solvents so i think people should move and i think society is also moving more towards the water based coatings right which is much safer in terms of uh, in terms of uh, voc levels and all of that in the paint voc i'm sorry i didn't get that point. so this is the uh, volatile organic component okay. right of paints right so that is also coming down and there are standards that the institutes have to set and every paint most of the paints have to come a uh, below a certain voc level right so that is uh, that is a certain criteria that most of the paint companies are adhering to and improving right improving it so earlier if there was we'll say for example 10% and just because the standard say 10% that doesn't mean that paint company should be at 10% if you can be at 5% you be at 5 right. if you can be at 1% go, be go at, beyond go beyond that because that is our obligation towards the society uh the other thing is okay these are the chemical or the i mean the health the safety precautions but the paint industry can add a lot of added benefits for you as well right like i told you antibacterial right you can also even uh, even with this virus with the covid virus there are elements that the paint industry can add plus like i told you earlier for the the mosquito repellent paint so while having this safety precautions the you can value add also for your safety correct through paint or through coatings and i believe there is also a lot of innovation such as recycling some of the waste and yes based on that where paints are created some correct. interesting points there yes now nishal on a final note let's talk about the talent pipeline now what are the challenges faced when you are trying to source the right talent and what can be really done in order to continue and make sure there is a proper talent pipeline in this industry I, that's a very important question. So, uh, and let me tell you why I'm asking this yes. because there can be a viewer who is wondering, okay, look, you know what? My parents run a small paint business. Should I really get into that? Or let's say my dad is actually a uh, someone who is providing these painting services. Should I really be in that? What would you say to them? So, I would say, in a paint industry, the chemist and the R and D part of it. is something that you need to be specialized in okay then you have your coating experts the the guys who actually they have the experience in how to do a coating the issues in the coating the technical part of it okay you have your sales staff right who know about the paint how to how to sort of sell it right and then you have your support staff as well so in this industry i would say the chemist and the r&d uh, that that resource is the resource that we need to protect right we need to have more laboratories right the paint companies itself should have their own r&d centers we should not depend on some uh, we'll say overseas laboratories to get our technology only if we create that laboratory system the r&d system that sort of system in this country that we can even have a graduate maybe a chemistry graduate being retained in this industry others And do we see a lot of them moving overseas yeah, so they, because because your r&d plants your major r&d plants are overseas right so that is one reason that um say the company that i am working for also we are investing in r and d facility in order to retain some of these talent because you get amazing talent in sri lanka right and we don't want them to sort of migrate right. and then then we get the service from overseas right so that is one money flows out of the country as well there correct so that is that is that is one angle and when you said talent pipeline also the other professionals in this coating industry okay uh, there are two i would say that with the competition that we have right and with this industry growing we can retain and we can we can sustain people within this industry and and you see a lot of people in the coating industry staying in the coating industry even if you take a if you take a sales guy right he would he would remain in the coating industry and maybe shift from one company to another yeah. or from a company that does decorative paints to a company that does powder coating or does automobile paints right so there is a there is a fair amount of flexibility where they can move from the companies itself and without moving out of the so career diversification options are there for them? are there are there and it's a good industry it's a it's a industry which is dynamic 
right? So, we have maybe 5 to 6 major players in the country, right? It is a very competitive market. There is a lot of challenges that you need to face in this industry, right? And you have to deal with maybe 5,000 to 6,000 hardware stores, right? So, the key players in the supply chain. Yes. So, you will have a lot of uh, maybe about 5 or 6 reps going into one shop, right? So, it's interesting. It's interesting how you get shelf share, how you get them to sort of push your product, right? It's, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting industry and it's an evolving industry, right? With new coatings coming in, maybe every six months you have some sort of new coating that is coming. And then there are opportunities for people to go and get trained abroad and come, right? We work with a lot of foreign suppliers, so we send our, our staff also abroad. The other companies do the same thing. So it's, I would say it's an it's a industry that people can enjoy, people can grow, right? And people can develop themselves as well. And the companies in Sri Lanka need to also focus. If you focus on the larger picture, it's easy to retain this stuff. But the focus should be on the R&D. R&D is where I feel we lack and where we are losing a lot of our chemistry graduates uh, in the country without the necessary facilities here to develop and to innovate. Michelle Ferdinando, thank you for joining us on Bisnomics and wishing you and the team all the best in your future endeavours to grow this industry to the next level in Sri Lanka. Good thank luck. you, Tarindu. Thank you for having me. Now you know the current situation of the paints and coating industry of Sri Lanka and the world. And we hope that this insight would enable you to paint a good layer, a good coating of profitability in your business in the coming week ahead. I will see you with the next episode. Have a profitable week ahead. Oh,